Okay, this is the PCR uh, primer tutorial that illustrates where primers bind on a piece of target DNA to allow PCR amplification to occur. So what we're interested in is this piece of DNA here, and this could be the SARS-CoV-2 uh, genome. It isn't, it's just a random piece of DNA, but it illustrates the process of how this works. So we have our DNA, we'll call that template DNA. I've done this in black text deliberately, so you'll be able to see what happens to this DNA in the reaction. The first thing we do is perform a heat denaturing step, and that separates this DNA into two single-stranded bits of DNA. What we then do is cool the reaction and allow the primers to bind. Now for a PCR reaction, what we want are two PCR primers to bind, one to this strand and one to uh, this strand, so that you can uh, amplify the DNA in between. So what we need to do is think, where would we put our primers to amplify this entire sequence? Remember that DNA amplifies in a five to three prime direction. So do you put your primer here, so DNA polymerase can go in this direction? Or do you put your primer here, so DNA polymerase can go in this direction? And you have to remember that if you put one primer here, you put one at the opposite side. If you put one here, you put one at the opposite side. So using your knowledge of DNA extending in a five prime to three prime direction and then uh, acknowledging that DNA is anti-parallel, five prime, five prime, three prime, three prime, what you should be able to do is place your two primers either here and here or here and here Maybe half of you will get it right, maybe half of you will get it wrong purely by, cho uh, by chance, or maybe you follow the process, but I will show you how it works. So you've got to put your primers there. Let's say the 16 bases or nucleotides in length. When you, what I want you to do is type your primer sequence here so that that sequence matches the DNA here. Okay, and remember, A's bind with T's, C's bind with G's. So what I want you to do over the first, next few minutes is have a go and type in where you think the primers are supposed to go. Okay, have a go at it. Let's see, well, see for yourself whether you get it right or wrong. Don't worry, I'm going to take you through the correct answer in a few minutes. So pause the video, have a go at the sheet, draw on your primers, and then restart. So firstly, I'm going to show you the wrong answer. Okay, so if you put your primer here, then your DNA would be three prime, and then you can put in your sequence C, 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 T, T, C, C, T, G, G, T, CT. Okay, like that. And then at the end of that sequence, there'll be a five prime end. The problem here is that DNA polymerase cannot extend in a three prime to five prime direction. It goes in a five prime to three prime direction. So our DNA polymerase is going to bind to this primer and shoot off in this direction the wrong way. So that is wrong. Those of you who got it right would have done the following. I acknowledge that's a five prime, and then put your sequence here. G, 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 A, A, G, G, A, G, C, C, A, G, G. Okay, and then three prime. This means that DNA polymerase can attach onto the three prime end and copy in this direction. Equally, you would then want to put your reverse primer up here. So it's in the opposite configuration to this one. All the, although all the base pairs are uh, pairing up correctly, you'll see that this one goes five prime to three prime in that direction. This one goes five prime to three prime in this direction. So DNA polymerase will attach here and will copy along 
this way. All we do need to do now is write down what our actual forward primer sequence is. That's quite easily. I can just copy that and place that there. Your reverse primer, however, is not quite so easy. What you have to do is type 5 prime and then effectively read your sequence backwards. So G, C, 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 T, T, C. I'm just reading backwards from this 5 prime this way. So I've got to T, C, C, T, G, T, G, T, T, K, G, A, A, C. 3 prime. Now the reason you have to go through this process is because when we design primers, we actually order them. I, I just order mine online. So I will go through this whole process, get a text file of the primer sequences that I want, and then email them to a company that does chemical synthesis of primers. They will make them for me, and they will post them to me, and I will get them in the post in about three days' time. And one of these that's about 20 nucleotides in length will cost about four or five pounds each. So it's really very simple, very cheap to do. Um, all you need is your DNA sequence in a little text file labeled 5 prime and 3 prime, 5 prime and 3 prime, and then the company that makes the DNA for you always deals with a 5 prime end and a 3 prime end. If you copied it like this and sent them the sequence like this, they would not be very happy. It's got to be in the right configuration. Anyway, that's probably a minor point because you won't be designing your own primers for quite a while. So all nicely colour coded now. This is what you should have on your sheet. You can see the reverse primer is there, your forward primer is there. You can put your five prime and your three prime ends on if you wish. So this shows what happens once your primers are bound and DNA polymerase has bound. Your primers bind, DNA polymerase attaches and copies all of the template DNA in this direction. And what I've done is colour coded this so that you can see where all the nucleotides are coming from in the newly created piece of DNA. So, our forward primer is green and all the new nucleotides that have been added in from that forward primer are purple. Our reverse primer is red and all the new nucleotides that have been added in are just colour coded blue in this case, just so you can see where things are coming from. So that's what's happened after the first cycle. So this is a product from the first cycle, two strands of DNA. In black is our original template, in green and purple is the original is the forward primer and the DNA that's been copied from that forward primer, and then in red is the reverse primer and DNA has been copied from the reverse primer. What we do now is heat that up to 95 degrees, allow it to cool in the presence of more primers, and those primers bind in the usual places. So this red one is going to bind here, this green one is going to bind here to the template DNA. Now what we find in cycle 2 onwards is that here the forward primer is binding to a piece of entirely synthetic DNA that was made from extending the reverse primer. And this piece of DNA finishes here. So when DNA polymerase copies this one, it goes along, goes along, it goes along, gets to the end and drops off the end. Similarly, this piece of DNA is made from a forward primer copying the template DNA, so let's say here. And it's basically this length, however many nucleotides there is. A reverse primer is bound here. The DNA polymerase copies in this direction, gets to the end and falls off. So these two pieces of DNA here are exactly the length from there to there. Whereas the original template DNA is much longer. This could be tens of thousands of base bases in length because it's a piece of DNA. What we will see is in subsequent cycles, we get preferential amplification of these entirely synthetic pieces of DNA and linear amplification of these. So these will increase exponentially. Basically, every cycle we do, we'll get one copy of DNA from this template. But then every cycle we do subsequently, we'll get 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32 copies 
from this piece. So we get exponential amplification of these and linear amplification of these. So this is the endpoint of the end of cycle two. We've got four copies of DNA. Um, and we have got uh, two synthetic, two semi-synthetic. So those are our entirely synthetic piece of DNA. Those are our semi-synthetic, this one and this one. And that DNA is now here. If we now heat up these four double-stranded pieces of DNA, heat them up, allow more primes to bind, we get this configuration um, and primes will bind and fill in every single gap. By the end of cycle three, our template's DNA is still lurking around there, but we're getting exponential amplification of DNA that is entirely synthetic, made up of forward primer, nucleotides extended from the forward primer, reverse primer, and nucleotides extended from the reverse primer. So all of these six pieces here are entirely synthetic. That's uh, the original template, and that's a piece of synthetic DNA attached to it. And every cycle that goes on from now onwards, we'll, here we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight piece of double-stranded DNA. The next cycle, we will have 16 double-stranded pieces of DNA. And the one after, we will have 32 double-stranded pieces of DNA. Once we get beyond cycle three, the vast majority of the DNA is exactly the length from there to there. And these two little, these two, which are variable lengths, it could be any length, um, will be a real minority in the reaction and we will not even see them. But we'll get exponential amplification of DNA of this length. So at the end of the next cycle, there'll be 16 strands, 14 will be synthetic to semi-synthetic, uh, as in half template, half synthetic. After 10 cycles, we're up to 1,000 copies, 20 cycles, a million copies, and 30 cycles, you're up to 1 billion copies. So if one piece of viral RNA converted to cDNA went into this reaction, after 30 cycles, if everything worked to 100% efficiency, we would have 1 billion copies of that DNA. That is more than enough to visualize in our experiments. So the question is, what do we then do with that? Um, DNA, how do we detect it? And if we're doing what I call normal PCR, polymerase chain reaction, that's just amplifying some DNA and detecting it, then we will use um, typically something called an agarose gel electrophoresis tank. So this here is a agarose gel. Agarose is very much like a very firm jelly. Uh, it's got a porous sieve-like uh, structure that will separate out large molecules of DNA from small molecules of DNA. So we load our samples in a well at the top of the gel. That's just an indentation in the gel. We fill this tank with uh, a, a buffer, water and some salts. We load our sample into the well and we use some glycerol with the DNA so that the sample sinks into the well. And then we apply an electric current and you can see this is the negative electrode, this is a positive electrode, and DNA is negatively charged. So DNA will move through the gel, and small pieces will move faster than large pieces. Very, very large pieces will barely even penetrate this gel, but the very small pieces will make it all the way down to the bottom. So we've performed what we call our electrophoresis on an agarose gel setup. We can also use polyacrylamide, that's a better version, but most people use agarose. Then what we do is when, they react, when this electrophoresis is finished, we stain the gel with a dye called ethidium bromide. Ethidium bromide uh, will make the DNA fluoresce. So we shine a UV light on the gel and we then take a photograph of it. This photograph is black and white. Uh, the ethidium bromide itself is actually red. It fluoresces beautiful red-pink colour. Now this gel here is the top of the gel. This is the bottom of the gel. Here at the top are the large pieces of DNA. Down at the bottom, the small pieces. And these are a set of size markers. And we can buy these of known size. So that's 300, 500, 1,000, 2,000 base pairs. And this is quite a large PCR product for a very specific um, experiment that we're doing. 
Um, so this is about 800 base pairs in length. This is the PCR product, also known as the amplified DNA. So in this experiment, we're just making a very large piece of DNA. Um, so we amplify, when we've amplified the DNA, we run it on the gel, separate it out by size. These are our size markers that tell us how big this piece of DNA, DNA is. And what you can see here, we've got six different uh, samples. They're all positive. They've all got a nice strong amplification. These have got some other strange bands. We sometimes get that in PCR. This is a sign of a non-optimal reaction here. Um, and I'm not going to go into any great details about why we've got the extra bands, but I was optimizing a PCR, trying to make it work perfectly. It works perfectly there. It doesn't work perfectly there. So that is how basic PCR works. Quantitative PCR is different. Quantitative PCR means we don't actually have to run a gel. We actually measure the formation of this DNA occurring every single cycle. So we can put in a fluorescent probe that binds to the DNA. And every, what you do is you heat and cool your reaction 30 times. But after every heating and cooling step, we measure the amount of fluorescence given off from that reaction tube and that is directly proportional to the amount of PCR product that has been formed. So quantitative PCR doesn't require running a gel and that's how we do it diagnostically. Um, and then the other difference uh, that the SARS testing uh, system uses is reverse transcription PCR where we've converted RNA to DNA and then we've performed our PCR and we are doing that PCR quantitative. So we can actually find out people who've got lots of virus versus patients who've got very, very little virus. And that's going to be important when we talk about sensitivity and specificity next week. Now, what I want you to all do now is, um, before moving on to antibody technology, is click on this link here. So go to the PowerPoint version of the slides, click on this link, and there's a little three minute video that beautifully explains the whole process of uh, polymerase chain reaction, quantitative PCR, and also the reverse transcription step that is required for this particular virus. Okay, so watch that and then move on to the next video, which is antibody and antigen detection methods.